Good morning, my friend. Dr. Lee Warren here with you, and I am so excited and grateful to be doing All In August in 2024 with you. This is day number five. It's All In August, and it's Mind Change Monday. We're going to smash those together today. And I'm going to bring you back part of an episode from last year on the sixth day of August. It turned out to be a Sunday. We had to talk about identity or insight. And I'm going to set this up for you a little bit differently this year. We're going to play part of that episode. I'm going to give you some new material on the front and back end. But I want to get you this idea that if you want to go all in, you have to recognize that you've gotten to some place in your life where you said something's not working. So something isn't happening for me the way I want it to. And you can apply this wherever, your spiritual life, your relationship, your marriage, your family, your ability to break certain habits or overcome certain addictions or certain places in your life where you're stuck. If you've been through some massive thing and you've been grieving, and you just can't seem to heal and you seem to be ruminating and your life seems to be becoming defined by that thing that's happened, some trauma that you've been through, some tragedy that's occurred, and you just can't seem to make progress and going forward, then it's time to go all in. Maybe it's time to make a change. Okay, Maybe there's some tools that we can give you with self-brain surgery to learn how to think differently about the thing that you've been through, about the situation that you can't seem to quite make progress, traction, action. You can't get satisfaction anymore, and it's time to change. But one of the things that makes us stuck, I think, is when we fail to recognize that we have mind down control over our brain and our body. We start to absorb this idea from culture that our brains are a certain way, and that means our life has to be a certain way. And we hear a lot in our culture right now about our identity, my personality, you do you, this is my truth. And we see that play out in certain ways. People take personality tests to find out how they are. And then they use that to bludgeon other people. You have to do this because that's how I am. You have to accommodate me. You have to accept this about me. And I just want to tell you, that's great. It's great to know how you're wired. It's great to know what your baseline is. It's great to know what your starting point is. But compassionately, Let me just say this to you, just knowing all that stuff about yourself and building a life where you defend that and you defend certain behaviors or certain attitudes or certain ways that you're living by justifying them because this is my identity. This is how I'm wired. This is my personality disorder. This is my genetic starting point. I am ADHD. I am neurodivergent. I am Enneagram 6. If you start to use that as a method of defending certain places in which you're stuck, you're not going to be able to break through. You're going to find limits on your life if you can't recognize that identity is not as important as recreation. Let me say that again. Identity is not as important as recreation. What do I mean by that? We're going to talk about that in this episode. The Bible says that when you follow Christ, for example, you die to yourself and he creates you as a new person. He says, I can change your mind and you can use your new transformed mind to rewire your brain, to make structural changes in your brain. You don't have to be stuck. And so I just want you to nudge this idea of identity into insight instead. If you understand how your brain's starting point is, if you understand how your brain is going to throw information up towards your mind, if you understand that you're going to have a bend towards seeing things in a certain way, that insight can become an incredible ally to you because you can say, okay, no, here we go again. My brain's trying to tell me that I have to be anxious about this. My brain's trying to tell me that I can't succeed here because of how I'm wired. I'm going to remember that I can exert top-down control here. I'm going to remember that I have the mind of Christ. I'm going to remember that I have a renewed mind. I'm going to remember that my mind has the ability to make structural changes, to rewire my brain, to change the neurotransmitter levels, to rewire even switching genes on and off. I don't have to live this way. I can have insight, but I don't have to be identified by this thing anymore. I'm ready to go all in with a renewed and transformed mind. We're doing All in August, and the textbook for All in August is our amazing guide, Mark Batterson's book, All In. But Mark wrote another book that has a a really helpful idea here. He wrote a book called Play the Man, 
And it's aimed at men. It's about how men can live the life they're called to. And if you're a man reading this, or if you've got sons, or you have a husband who's stuck in some way, play the man would be helpful. Okay. But he talks in play the man about this idea of making decisions against yourself. And that's something that's relevant to all of us. Okay. If you want to make some changes, I'm just telling you, you're going to come to a place where your flesh, your heart, your life, your past history, your personality, your baseline personality, your whatever you want to call it, your identity, if you will, is going to fight you on making these changes. And you're going to say to yourself, maybe I just can't change. Maybe this is just how I am. But if you're going to make changes, my friend, you're going to have to do some battle with yourself. And sometimes that means deciding against yourself. To say, this is the time of day when I usually open the bag of Cheetos. This is when I reach for the corkscrew and open a bottle of wine. This is the time when I turn on the television instead of reading something that could help me grow or learn and change in some way. This is the time when I turn on pornography instead of going to try to fix my marriage. This is the time when I do X, Y, or Z. This is when my body and my brain and my heart tell me that I want certain things and I have to decide, do I want the new all-in life that I'm going for, that I'm dreaming about, that I really wish I could have, that I wake up tomorrow and say, not again, I messed up again. I really, I didn't make any progress yesterday. I've wasted all this opportunity. Or do I want to anesthetize myself again? Do I want to give in to the way it's been? Just remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And what got you here won't get you there. So what are some decisions today, friend, on this fifth day of all in August? What are some decisions that you need to start making against yourself if you want yourself to have a different outcome tomorrow than you had today. If you want all in August to end without you saying, it's just like last year, I ended up in the same spot all over again. What are some decisions that you need to make against yourself? And this is not necessarily negative. We're not talking necessarily about sin or addictions or anything necessarily bad. But you have to remember that there's a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller, I think is his name. Yeah, Gary Keller, The One Thing. He says, Every time you say yes to, to something, you have to say no a thousand times to defend that yes. Like you've got to learn this holy no. We stop saying yes to everything. So sometimes making decisions against yourself is just to recognize that you have this personality of always saying yes to everybody, of never being willing to say no. And then you regret it and you do it half heartedly or you back out at the last minute and you hurt people, mess people up because you said you would do something and you didn't because you didn't just say no in the first place. Sometimes that's a decision against yourself. Would you rather hurt somebody's feelings for a second right now or really mess up your whole program, your whole plan, your whole path because you said yes to so many things? What are some things you could say no to yourself about if you want to change your mind and change your life, if you want to go all the way in? What are some decisions you could make against yourself? So that's the backdrop. We're going to go into this episode from last year now where we talked about identity versus insight. And I think it'll be helpful to you. Just think about some things. Maybe take a piece of paper and write down, what are some decisions? If, if I want September 1st to look different in 2024 than it did in 2023, if I want to say, you know what? I did it. I went all in. And I can see this incredible progress. What are some decisions you might need to make against yourself if you want to end up in a better place for yourself, if you want to love tomorrow more, if you want to stop paying tomorrow taxes, if you want to stop treating a bad feeling with a bad operation. If you want to wind up in September in a different place than you did at the end of July, what are some decisions that you need to start making, perhaps against yourself even? To get there, I think we need to think a little bit about insight or identity. So let's get after it now. A listener named Burva wrote in yesterday. I don't know where she's from, but check this out. Dr. Warren, love listening. If I, I would like your opinion, please, about personality traits and types and the assessments that are used to identify those. I have used assessments, Myers-Briggs, Clifton, Strength Finders, etc., for years for myself and for college students I was working with. I have always found these assessments to be pretty accurate and very helpful, both in relationships and understanding our strengths and in part for evaluating career choices. First, what is your opinion of assessments like this? Are they supporting theories? Are the supporting theories obsolete? Next, as a strong feeler... As identified by assessments and my own experiences, I find it challenging to manage those feelings. In fact, I feel led by feelings quite often. I am proud of being intuitive and empathetic, traits that I believe are driven by being a feeler. 
As I listen to All in August, I feel challenged and curious about successfully doing self-brain surgery. It seems almost impossible for a natural feeler. Thoughts? So, hey, thanks for this email. This is a great email, and it's exactly the kind of stuff we're getting at, okay? When you talk about being a natural feeler, for example, I'm really glad you brought this up. We're always talking about how feelings aren't facts. Feelings aren't facts. And the truth is that some people are more naturally prone to having strong emotion. And that strong emotion can sometimes lead us into believing things that may or may not necessarily be true or feeling nobody else understands us or nobody else gets it or nobody else sees who we really are. We can be sometimes, like you said, led by our feelings and we have to be careful with that. And the idea of personality types and personality tests is super important. In fact, every psychologist would probably recommend putting patients through those to help us to understand the basis of how we're wired. God made us all in his image and he made us all with our own personality and our own um, strengths and weaknesses. And the thing about personality tests, and for Christians, a lot of people use one called the Enneagram. And you'll see if you go on social media, people actually posting. So I would say two things. One, the more liberal Christians or some of the non-Christian folks, if you scroll through their Instagram or their Twitter or their, or their Facebook profiles, you'll see a lot of people that are posting some really personal information about themselves in their profile. So you'll say John Smith, he slash him, uh, Enneagram 8, Myers-Briggs, blah, blah, blah. You know, they'll list all these things that we're supposed to know about them up front before we interact with them. And they're supposed to, that those things are supposed to tell us how we're supposed to interact with those people, right? So the thing is that we're, we're posting information about ourselves almost as a way to say, hey, this is how I am. You should watch how you behave around me because this is uh, what I expect from you. I expect you to interact with me in accordance with my personality type. So sometimes that can become a problem, though, because we're not just informing people, but we're almost warning people. Because for many of us, I think, sometimes the personality type becomes something that we use to defend our actions and defend our behavior rather than giving insight into it. So the, the two words I want to give you today are insight versus identity. Okay, you hear a lot about identity today in the, in the media and in our culture. There are a lot of people talking about this is my identity or that's my identity. This is how I feel. You have to watch out for me. Okay, and I would just suggest that as Christians, we need to filter what we learn about ourselves from personality types, what we learn about ourselves from standardized testing, what we decide we feel about ourselves from whatever it might be, whatever aspect of your of your personality, your identity, your, your thought processes about yourself. We all have to put all of that on the altar of serving Christ. Because the fact is, God did make us all in his image, and he did make us all with unique personalities and unique um, have unique ways to look at the world and how we feel about ourselves and all those things and unique ways and how we process emotion and how we come up with thought processes. All those are unique. But also, God called all of us to deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow him. Check out what Jesus said to the disciples in Luke chapter 9. He's starting in verse 23. He said this, Then he said to all of them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? And check out Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting at 14. Paul says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The thing is, if we serve Christ, he's not just our savior. He didn't just wipe the slate clean and we get to go on. And Mark Batterson said, are we following him or is he following us? Like, hey, thanks for saving me. Follow me into this lifestyle that I've chosen or follow me into this set of feelings that I want to make sure everybody else honors and makes me feel good about how I am. Make sure that Jesus follows us. I and mean, that's not what he says. If anybody wants to follow me, you must deny yourself and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. So here's the thing, friend. Here's what I'm getting at. We can choose to let personality types give us insight into our baseline of how we're wired 
so that we can use that information to make better choices going forward. Hey, I know I'm vulnerable to this. I know I'm, I know I tend to get tripped up by how I feel about these things. I need to watch out for these situations where my emotions are high. I need to watch out for places where I tend to fall into certain thought pattern, certain thought patterns and traps. And that throws me off and I get offended. And every time I do that, this happens with my husband. We get in this fight because I'm offended and I can't hear anything beyond that. Or every time he says that, I feel this. And then I say that and then he feels that and it turns into this. If you have insight into your personality type, you can say, you know what? I need to arm myself with a little thought or a little prayer or a little meditation or a little reading or a little worship music or something before I go into those situations, because I know that's going to trip my personality. I need to be prepared for that. So you can use them for insight. You're Enneagram 6, and that means you tend to think and feel these certain ways. You can use it for insight, or you can use it for identity. So you could, instead of saying, hey, I need to watch out, I need to be careful, I need to be wise, I need to be thoughtful and, and careful about how my personality tends to lead me into certain patterns and behaviors and thoughts, or you can say, you know what, this is how I am and everybody needs to bend the knee to my feelings because that's just how it is. I'm made that way and God made me this way and you better watch out because if you don't honor how I feel or how I look or how I you know, am, am wired, then you're injuring me. You're attacking me because that's how I am. So I would just submit to you, friend, that personality tests can be extremely useful in identifying our strengths and our weaknesses, not just our strengths, but our potential vulnerabilities. Think about superheroes. So the old classic Superman always has a kryptonite. There's always a weakness that the superhero has, a vulnerability lurking out there somewhere that's going to trip them up. And even the Superman can't behave or perform in a super way when that vulnerability is exposed, right? So I, I feel, to answer your question, it's a long-winded way to answer your question, I feel like it's great to understand, to use those assessments to help us understand how we're built and how we're wired and how we think and how we feel. But I do not use them and I do not encourage people to use them to manipulate other people into behaving differently so as to not offend our sensibilities built around our personality type. Does that make sense? So I guess the the long-winded answer to your question is yes, sometimes these things can lead us into almost having our feelings hurt or being offended or outraged on a constant basis. Or they can give us insight in how to navigate the world in a more wise way, how to take those things that we learn from our personalities and say, you know what, I'm going to put this on the altar. But God gave me these things because I'm supposed to use them for his glory. And there's some ways in which my particular personality can help a group navigate a situation or can help my family or can help me have em- empathy for, for other people or can help me to lead my family in a better way or to lead my business in a better way. If you understand how you are, you can use those gifts of how God made you in his image as as ways to honor him. Or you can take them and internalize them and say, nope, this is my, this is who I am. And I'm going to put a wall around anybody who tries to, to act like my feelings aren't as important as theirs because that's how I am. Insight or identity. Those are the two ways that I would look at it. Two ways that I would look at it. I want to throw you one more scripture. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, what does it look like if the Holy Spirit is living inside you? So if we understand if we accept Christ, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit and he's supposed to be inside us, helping us to, to help us calm our mind, to help us have power and direction and purpose. And sometimes even to help us know what to pray when we're devastated, when life is hard. And God says, Paul says in Galatians 5, and God inspired him to write this, that when the Holy Spirit's inside someone, the life will bear fruit in certain ways. And the fruit of the Spirit, so the, the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit inside you is this bunch of character traits that God calls the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are character traits and qualities that someone will have if they have the Holy Spirit inside them, okay? The last one is self-control. Now, growing up, this one was used in my church, which is a pretty legalistic, fundamentalist type upbringing. Self-control was always taught and used as a way to 
okay, if, if you have self-control, if you have the fruit of the Spirit, then you don't drink and you don't smoke and you don't cuss and you don't have premarital sex and you, for goodness sakes, you don't dance. Because the reason the church is against premarital sex is because it leads to dancing. That's a joke. But really, there was like, like all these things that you don't do because that's self-control. And that's what we were taught. And it's true. Self-control clearly is about not doing certain things with yourself, with your body. But I would suggest to us that most of the teachings of Jesus are more nuanced than they appear to be on the surface. Jesus would come and say, hey, you Pharisees, the Old Testament law says you're not supposed to commit adultery. So you guys are perfect. You're not out there committing adultery. That makes you feel holy. But I say to you, if you look at a woman lustfully in your heart, you've already committed adultery. The word says that the Old Testament law says don't commit murder. I say to you, if you hate your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. Jesus raises, he takes it up a notch. He makes it more nuanced and more difficult and more about our heart, more about what's inside us. So if we say the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, and you, Jesus would come and say, hey, you're doing a good job. You're, you're not at the bars every night. You're not gambling. You're not uh, putting a needle in your arm. You're not watching pornography. You're not doing all these things. You're on the surface. The outside of your cup looks pretty good. But what about your heart? Jesus would raise that question. What about your heart? Are you a slave to your feelings? Are you protecting and walling off certain aspects of your life from me, from my lordship, because you have taken some tests that told you this is who you are and you're going to protect that at all costs and you're going to be offended if anybody challenges it? What if self-control is also about learning how to get our minds under control, about being willing to open the door to some parts of our heart and spirit that we thought couldn't be changed because that's just who we are. But we forgot that if we're going to come to him, the old has to get gone. We get buried in baptism and the old self dies and we were raised a new creation in his image. And he says, if you want to come to me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. So there's sometimes, I would just submit, there's sometimes when God asks us to put our own personality and our own feelings and our own baselines on his cross and let him give us a new way to feel. In the book All In, chapter 16, The Idol That Provokes Jealousy, if you're reading the book, I would just spend an hour or so in chapter 16. There's this weird verse in Ezekiel 8.3 that says, The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God he took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. There was an idol in this gate to the inner court that made God jealous when he saw it because people were worshiping that idol and not him. It turns out it was a sex goddess. It was a fertility goddess. And God basically was jealous that people were worshiping the created thing more than the creator. And Mark Batterson writes this incredible chapter. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of it. God is not jealous of anything. He can't be. The Almighty is all sufficient, but the Creator is jealous for everything because it all belongs to Him. He's not jealous of anything, but He's jealous for everything because it all belongs to Him. Every blade of grass, every drop of water, every grain of sand, in the timeless words of Abraham Kuyper, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. Everything was created by him and for him, and that includes you, all of you. There never has been and never will be anyone like you. And that isn't a testament to you. It's a testament to the God who created you. And that means no one can worship God like you or for you. You are absolutely irreplaceable in God's grand scheme, and God is jealous for you, all of you, every thought, every desire, every dream, every word, every moment. He is the one who causes your synapses to fire. He's the one who conceives desires within your hearts of hearts, your heart of hearts. He is the dream giver. He is the word. He is the one who measures your days. It's all from him and for him. That's why he's jealous. And that's why all in and all out is the baseline. That's why he will settle for nothing less than all in and all out. The character of God is revealed by the names of God. There are more than 400 names for God, and each one reveals a dimension of who he is. One of those was revealed by Moses on Mount si- to Moses on Mount Sinai. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous 
is a jealous God. Did you catch the double emphasis? Listen, God isn't just jealous. He is doubly jealous. And when God says something more than once, you need to think twice about what it means. You don't belong to God once. You belong to God twice. Once by virtue of creation. Twice by virtue of redemption. He gave us life via creation. And we were dead in our sin. He gave us eternal life via redemption. We don't owe him one life. We owe him two lives. And that's why God is doubly jealous. Listen, friend, God isn't jealous of things. He's jealous for things. He created you, your personality type, your unique personhood. And God is jealous because he wants you to use those aspects of the character and nature that he gave you for his glory. To use your identity to serve him. He wants to give you insight into how he made you but not to have you wall it off and use it to fight your own battles or to make other people bend a knee to the God of you. So the question is answered, I think, fairly simply in the idea that God wants us to understand how he made us, but we're willing to put all of those things on the altar for him when our personality conflicts his calling. That's what I would say. Very useful tools, very incredibly helpful but for insight and not identity. Listen, there's one last thing from Mark Batterson's chapter that he says, and I think it's brilliant. He talks about how the key to identifying your idols, if you have idolatry in your heart, we, none of us none of us probably have a carved idol in, in our closet. People used to actually do that. None of us probably do. After revealing what was in the hidden rooms, Ezekiel encountered one more idol at the entrance of the north gate of the temple. He saw women mourning a god called Tammuz, the Babylonian Babylonian fertility god of spring. The key word is mourning. They were mourning this god. If you want to identify your idols, Mark Batterson says, reverse engineer your emotions. Follow the trail of your tears or fears, your cheers or jeers. And if you follow it all the way to the trailhead, you'll come face to face with the idols in your life. So this is God, Tammuz was an idol for them. But what makes you really mad or really sad or really glad? What ruins your day or makes your day? What triggers your strongest emotional reaction? Listen to this paragraph from Mark Batterson. The indictment against the Israelites isn't just that they were having an emotional affair with a false god. What's even worse is that they were flatlined in their feelings toward the God who created them with an amygdala a part of your brain and the medial temporal lobe that manages your emotions. If your deepest feelings are reserved for something other than the Almighty God, then that something other is an emotional idol. Chris Hodges, our old pastor in Alabama, used to come on Sunday mornings, and, and deep south Alabama is a p- football powerhouse, right? You got Auburn and LSU and Alabama in the area, Georgia in the area, lots of big football fans, and it's a big deal. He would come on Sunday morning. And they would play a worship song and he would get everybody to cheer and stand on their feet and praise God. And then he would say, never give more praise on Saturday to your football team than you're willing to give on Sunday to your God. Be more excited about God and worshiping him than you were about the touchdown that Georgia scored yesterday. He's just saying God's jealous of our affection. God's jealous of our heart. He's jealous of our emotional state. And he's jealous of our personality type, friend. So please don't think anything I'm saying here is harsh. I'm just saying these tests can be extremely useful. I think they're great for employers to understand how their employees are wired. But in terms of your, your walk and your life and how you live your life and how happy you are, really, you're going to be happier by being willing to understand those things and sometimes sacrificing them to him. So say, I'm I, I understand that I tend to get really emotional about this type of interaction with other people, and I need to learn how to control that because that doesn't look very much like Jesus when I blow up about those things. I need to learn how to have insight into my personality so I can use it to help other people and look more like Jesus and magnify his name and feel happier and be better in my life. So I can use it to help me do self-brain surgery, to get things under control so I'm not led around by this emotional ring in my nose like a bull. But I can rather navigate my life in a way that, that makes an impact and a difference. I mean, I also finished the days with a greater sense of peace and understanding that I, that I did a good job today 
you know, wasn't spending all day just fired up about how somebody didn't honor my personality type. My two words, insight and identity. If you're willing to go all in with God, you're going to have to be willing to deny yourself and take up your cross. And sometimes that takes willingness even to change how we interact with our own baseline personality type and emotional traits. Sometimes we just have to go all in and give it to him because we don't want to make God jealous of the very thing that he gave us to honor him with. So I hope that's a, that's a long-winded answer to your question, Verbo, but I hope it's helpful. That's my take on it. I think they can be incredibly useful, but for insight and not for identity, for tools to help us navigate our life, not weapons to help beat other people into compliance with how we want to feel or how we think we're supposed to be interacted with based on our feelings aren't facts. They're chemical events. We don't have to believe every thought that's in our head. And we need to relentlessly refuse to participate in our own demise or that of others. So if we want to be good self-brain surgeons, we have to honor the way God made our brains. Yes, we have to honor the way God made our personalities. Yes, but we also have to be willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Because when he makes us a new creation, the old is gone and the new has come. And those things that he gave us that are evidence of the fruit of the spirit inside of us, one of them is self-control. And that means controlling our inner self too. Even when it makes us emotional, even when it makes us upset, even when it, when people hurt our feelings, we have to learn how to use that to still push glory towards him and honor towards him because that's how we find true happiness. And the good news, friend, is you can start today. That was good. We got to make some decisions about identity or insight. We got to make some decisions against ourselves, perhaps. What are those things for you today, friend? Write them down. Do me a favor. Share this with your friends, okay? The downloads are going nuts this month. You're getting all in. The community's building steam. I can feel it. And today, let's try to get to 10,000 downloads. Let's try to get 10,000 people to listen to this episode. If we're going to do that, you're going to have to share it with four or five people, okay? Take a second. Copy the link. Text it to somebody and say, hey, go all in with me. We've talked about this. I know you're trying to make some changes. I know you want to do this. Let's do it together. Let's go all in. Download this episode. Listen to it today. Let's talk about it tonight. Text me with what you thought about it. What are some decisions you can make against yourself? Send it to five or 10 friends today. Just take that time and do it. And if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, please join us in the newsletter community. We do deep dive into self brain surgery every Sunday since 2014. DrLeeWarren.substack.com is the newsletter. DrLeeWarren.substack.com. Sign up for it. It's free. It'll really help you, okay? And, we're, and we'll be more connected. We can communicate. We can talk about things on a deeper level, okay? So do me the favor of sharing this episode right now. Send it to somebody that you care about and say, hey, friend, let's go all in together and let's see what happens. I want people all over the world to go all in, and I know you do too. And so let's share it. Let's get it out there. Let's make it happen. Listen, make some decisions against yourself today. Don't think that you're bound by your identity because your mind is in control of your brain and you can change it. It can give you deep insight to understand where you start, but you're not obligated to behave the way you've always behaved because you know what? You can change your mind and you can change your life, my friend. And the good news is you can start today.